Hey everybody, I am Kevin Cools, TME, Technical Marketing Engineer for Cisco, focusing on enterprise networks and programmability in specific. You can see my Twitter handle there, SDN Dude. Feel free to reach out to me, any questions or comments. We've probably seen this slide too many times today, but I'm throwing it up there just as a little, little map. You are here now. We're talking about the APIs. This is where we're going to focus the conversation about the device layer, the foundation moving up. And we're going to break it down real quick. Just model data, transport, and how to consume it. Most of you guys were there, heard the speech from, uh, from Chuck yesterday about all these devices talking to each other, billions upon billions of, you know, billions of machine-to-machine of -machine communication. What does that mean for us as networking engineers, right? Do we have more configuration to do, more data to grab off of that? We want to know what's going on on our switch or router or you know, fill-in-the-blank device at any time. So what is it? how does that affect us? Does it mean we have to type faster, try to keep up? That's not gonna, it's not going to scale, obviously. Does that mean we get to do lots of fun screen scraping? That's not much fun either. CLI, it's not really the answer. It's been what we've been accustomed to. It's a relationship we have. We love our CLI. But it's time to see other people. Let's think about that model-driven data and, op and configuration that Chuck also mentioned about yesterday, about how we've s seen the tides turn and how those communications are with machine to machine. We don't need the people in the way. And in order to do that, we need to make it more flexible, make it fit their need, not ours. We don't need visual text information. We need key value pairs. We need simple to parse information that can be fed into programmability, to, to programs, to applications, to and add some richness there. So you'll see the device features we know and love down at the bottom. Oh, we all are great on BGP. We're fantastic with our QS and ACLs. But it gets a little fuzzy when we talk about these models. You know, OK, so now we're changing from CLI to, a, to some kind of a tree structure. Now, how does that work? How does that impact us? How do we take advantage of that, right? Well, within those models, there's, there's two major factors to think about, all right? We have operational data, and we have configuration data, right? Now, the operational data is pretty clear. That's read-only stuff. You know, it's what we might have gotten yesterday from show commands or from SNMP polling or traps or what have you. And there's that configuration data, right? That's us making a change. That's what you do within ConfT, effectively, right? Now, within those model types, there's the native models. That fits our box like a glove. It's what it, our box does. It looks kind of like the CLI and the tree structure. And we're going to see that in a minute. And then we have these open models. So what does that mean, right? Is that a, it's a model that fits the function. I don't care what your box looks like. BGP is AS's and neighbors. I, don't, I have no concern with what your particular CLI or the way you implement that. It is a functional aspect of that protocol. It's clear, right? It means the same thing to Cisco, to those who will remain unnamed vendors, and across all of our different platforms as well. We want a consistent, experience across them. So yeah, the, the, the rule of thumb is use your old models when, you're, when you can and the native when you must. And that doesn't mean native is a bad word. It means that that's the stuff that doesn't fit in those open models. You know, those are driven by the community, like, like Google and those folks for open config or ITF. And they have to abstract to what the larger vendor community has. So that's that may not have all the differentiators for Cisco or, or vendor A and B. So they're going to have native models that specifically fit their function that can showcase all their coolness as well. So we got to move that data back and forth. Having it on the box, that's only half the battle, right? We've got protocols. We've got NetConf. I'm sure you guys have heard of that. Or, or RESTConf. You know, sounds interesting, right? It's, it's a new way to interact with the box. It's designed for a, an application, a machine to talk to that device. Now, there's a couple things that, that are great along with the way that NetConf works. There's this capability discovery. Your initial handshake, it gives you all this information about what that box can do, what these, what we're going to call remote procedure calls, 
what it can do. Can it edit config? Can it get the config? How does it do it? How many data stores? You know, like you're running, you're writing, and your candidate stores. And not only that, it shows you all the models that that box will honor. So that means that you have, in one moment, one initial handshake, you have a complete picture of what that box can do and what your automation framework can leverage from that box. Now, after that, we got the transa and those transactions. That means that if I make a mistake, you know, say, think about last week, we're talking CLI, we're not talking, you know, Yang models. I have some scripting or some, I'm doing some configuration by hand. I make a mistake. That command goes through, or, or if I have, if I'm copying and pasting 100 lines and two of them or one of them have a mistake, I'm not really sure of my state. Whereas we package all these commands, these, these changes in that edit config together, and we throw them over as a single RPC. Now it's either going to get my, the, the handy OK message back, or I'm going to get error, you know, bad line item or, or bad, uh, bad object, something like that, to give me some an idea of what I did wrong. And it's not going to configure any of it. It's either going to roll back what it, did, what it, what, uh, what it was you know, going to configure, or it does absolutely nothing and says, Hey, I'm, I'm good. I'm in point A. I'm not in point B. I'm not in between. I'm right at that known good start. In addition to that, we've got things called notifications. It's what, we're, what we would consider telemetry in a lot of cases. You know, it's a way that we can subscribe to information and let that come to us, you know, periodically. It's different than SNMP from the, from the perspective of that it's not as uh, CPU intensive. It's, we can do a, a couple different ways of making that a, an advantage to us, because we have thousands of different leaves now of that big that tree that we can grab data from. We don't need to know some crazy string of numbers that happens to be some OID that doesn't really mean anything to me. If I want to know uh, something about BGB tables, I look for the Yang model that has BGB in the name. It's not rocket science. It's self-describing. It's a tree that makes sense. You can grab something out of the data. It's relatively new, okay? So we had NetConf for years, but having NetConf that supports Yang it was relatively new. That came out in 16.3, um, I think mid to late last year. And we updated it with 16.5 earlier this year in March that has a much more uh, modular set of Yang models that, that describe each of those particular functions. It's a lot easier to work with, and it gives us the option to patch a particular model. So instead of having some monster model, it makes it easy to, oh, there's some new functionality that Google wants to do in their open config BGP model. Okay, we'll patch that particular model and we don't need to upgrade or change any uh, iOS or reboot or any real impact to that box. Some good stuff about RESTConf. REST is everywhere. If you, I mean, in this room, there's probably, what, 100 different things that could make a REST call right now. It's ubiquitous, it's everywhere. So that means that it gives you some flexibility as to what can grab data off the box. Now, I don't want 100 things in this room talking to my, my router or switch, but it gives me flexibility to what can. So an easy example to think of, to wrap your head around, is say, I've got a, trouble, I got a ticket that was open. There was some issue on an interface. It created a ticket in service now. Well, I can reach out via REST to my box and say, hey, um, give me some interface statistics for that interface. Give me my BGP peers. Give me whatever I want to see package that in the ticket, so when I get paged, I can see what the whole story is. I have some color and texture now. I can say, well, that's no big deal. I'm going back to dinner, or I'm going back to my movie, or whatever I was doing with my free time, and I don't need to go out to the car, or go down to the office, and kick up the laptop, and, and log into the network. It uses a much easier data uh, um, encoder, encoding with JSON. It's a little more user-friendly. It's much more of the, the modern web interface you may be familiar with. And it's new, from, at least from a support perspective. It's been out for a while, but now we have to have the, the, uh, the QA behind it so that we can fully uh, validate that, that, the, that RESTConf is something you can call attack upon. So how do we consume that stuff? Well, let's do it instead of talking about it. All right, where's my, so. Hopefully you guys are familiar with a Jupyter Notebook. It is a 
Markdown, looks like a web page. It's not a magic web page. It is a Python uh, kernel running in a web page, right? In this particular case, I made myself a nice little container that has Python and all the libraries I want and, and gives me a little uh, interface for me to look at. It's great for an educational tool. It's great to walk through and not have to make me type stuff because I'll for sure mess it up. So what we're going to do now is we're just going to take a, uh, a quick uh, uh, trip down memory lane about what it's like to uh, get information from a box via, you know, and, and the calls we used to make back in the day. We would say, oh, well, I want to get the, uh, the show inventory, what have you. What's that going to look like? Well, I got all this text back. Uh, what do I do with that? Well, it's not the worst thing in the world. Our friends, you know, Jason Edelman and those of Network to Code have done great work. We've got all this great regex stuff we can take advantage of, but what if there's a new field? Somebody's got to update that. It's, it's a great, great feature for what we have today, but it's a little brittle moving forward. And you can see this one's a little easier. Now, what if I did something like a show IP route? You can see how I formatted that now into a nice, nice set of dictionaries, a list. Now, something, I have something I can search upon. You know, say I'm looking for a particular device. I can search upon that real quickly. This is my old demo with my switch was alive, so that we're not going to see a cat 9K because we're talking to CSR right now. But you know, say we look at something a little more complicated, a little more involved, something like a route table. There's a lot of information there. There's protocols that change, you know, some of their fields. There's you know information from PFR. There's a lot of stuff, a lot of work that you would have to put into that regex. So let's not do it then. Let's take advantage of something that was built to give us key value pairs. So we're going to make that same call, but we're going to do it via net, netconf. So here you see a lot of, <laughs> a lot of uh, XML. Now that's not easy to read, so let's make it easier for us. We'll do some filtering of that and give us the information that's reasonable, something we want to look at. All right? I want destinations. I want interfaces. I want you know, well, what protocol it's using. That's something that makes sense to me. That's some texture. These are routes that I can look at and you know, say, hey, I can parse through if there's some routes I don't expect to see, or maybe if, you're, if this was instead a BGP table and I saw an influx of a bunch of prefixes, like, oh, wait a minute. You know, if I'm a managed, managed service provider, somebody's messing around with my BGP, or somebody's uh, trying to uh, DOS me or something like that, and I can get information like that, get some really quick information that would feed into my programming. I mean, obviously, we're, we're clicking next here, but in reality, this is going to be an application. And so, again, we're taking advantage of that model structure that gives us that, that tree structure, that key value pairs. I threw this in there just to give us a nice little graphic. And within that, we have so many different models. I have a couple of here. I don't know if anybody has anyone they're particularly interested to look at, but a, a pretty good generic one that makes sense to us is the open config interfaces. All right. I guess this is a good point to mention. This is going to be on my GitHub repo, so anybody and their brother can play along at home, spin up their own CSR, run the, this, uh, this. I already have it in a container. There's no real work to do. If you have Docker and you have a CSR image, you're done. Mm -hmm. you know? And so you can play along and get to know some of these models yourself. And so we're going to go ahead and draw that out. You can see the tree structure. You can see it looks a heck of a lot like you know, CLI, where you have interface, you have you know, the, you, ways you can configure, MTU type, IP, all this read-only data, all the ROs, that means that's operational data that I can get back. And you can see here, the stack for NetConf, we borrowed stuff that already worked, right? We've got SSH on the bottom. We've got rem remote pr procedure calls. They've been around forever. And we got these specific verbs of get, get config, edit config. It's pretty obvious what they're talking about as well. And then we have that data that's Yang formatted, but in an XML encoding. So let's take a, a look at a couple things. I mean, we can make this interactive if anybody wants to look at. Uh, we've got CPU data, memory data. Um, uh, this one is kind of interesting now because the power outage we had and the, uh, the temperature that was up in the, uh, up in the data center this would have been better on my switch if we still had that up, uh, where we get the temperature on the box. And then we also could look at you know, kind of the corollary to a show inventory, this open config platform. So we're actually going to look at that one, unless anybody has any uh, disagreements. Let's see which one I had a mistake there. 
But let's try instead to do the memory one. Thank you. So I've got some memory statistics about what's free, what's used. That's useful information that you can quickly reply upon or respond upon. And I can turn this into a dictionary, make it something interesting to me. Now say I have, so this was looking for the, unfortunately I don't have the environment sensor working because this is the, the CSR. But I can also look at configuration data, right? So say I want to look at my show run interface, right? Effectively from NetConf. So that's going to grab all the configurations of all my interfaces, you know. So I've got IP, you know, I got NetMask, I can see, you know, different different interfaces, different sub-interfaces, all the stuff you'd expect to see in a show, show run interfaces that you can take action upon with a programmable interface. Well, that's not all. Let's think about RESTConf, right? That's the alternative method. So let's make some calls from there and see. Oh, you know, that's right, because there's a little bit different. Uh, I need to, didn't configure that on my CSR. So let's pop in there real quick. Don't you just love live demos, especially when your device crapped out five minutes before the demo. Uh, uh, but no, we'll get there. OK. So we'll give that a minute. And we should hopefully get a response, or we'll come back to that one. All right, now we're getting, now it's talking. So while it's doing that call, the rest calls take a little bit longer. We're going to talk about YDK. Right? The Yang Developers Kit. So I already mentioned about the structure of these Yang models, right? They looked strikingly similar to a lot of programming concepts. You've got containers in Yang, you've got classes in Python, you've got lists in both, you've got type definitions within Yang that you could also make those same type definitions in Python. So for example, I don't want my VLAN to be just an int32, right? I want it to be an int32, but from what, 1 to 1004, 1008 to 4090 something? I don't know. You guys may know better than me. I'm a little bit removed from my CCIE studies. <laughs> but you get the gist, right? It, it's, you can structure and put constraints upon the data. And you can take those constraints that you already did in Yang, you can carry them over into your, your program, programming language of choice. So in this case, we can see we're importing libraries. So I've turned these Yang models now into Python libraries. Or, well, to be fair, Santiago Alvarez turned these Yang models <laughs> into Python libraries that I'm importing and I'm consuming. I'm going to leverage these CRUD providers that he made for create, read, I always forget the read, uh, 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 update and delete. So I can use those as my verbs in Python because it's really the, the, the language that they speak of the, of the developer. And you'll notice there's no XML. There's no real understand. I don't need to understand the structure of what the device does. I've got classes. I've got a structure that a, a Python developer would understand. Now, I'm not telling you that you're all going to lose your jobs to Python developers. What I'm telling you is that you can leverage your expertise in architecture, in design, in building the template, building the golden configuration. And if you can, you know, speak the language of these developers, they can go ahead and they can code it. And they can hand it to your operational staff. We can have you know, uh, more of a DevOps environment where you have an operational staff deploying the configurations, iterating through them based on your templates that you tested in your lab. And there's no configuration sprawl. There's no change, oh, well, we had to do it this way because this side or some guy prefers to configure BGP this way. No, you have your standards that are then turned into Python code by your developers and deployed. I've always argued that what's more important than the APIs themselves is the tools that they enable. You know, something totally. like 
everything that was presented earlier today. However, it is important to be able to interact with the APIs directly when necessary. Mm -hmm. So you asked, you know, does everybody here know Jupyter? And, and I nodded, but I lied. I don't know what, <laughs> what the tool is that you're using. So what, what exactly are you doing with Jupyter right there? Well, Jupyter, all Jupyter is, is it's giving me a Python kernel and a very easy interface. So it's a web page, right? So it's just running Flask or some, or some other, uh, you know, uh, slow recipe. Your Mac right there. Yeah, I mean, I, it's just a container that I'm running. You know, if you're... It's built on top of iPython, if I remember correctly. <laughs> it, well, it's exactly iPython, yes. Yeah. So yeah, I could uh, open up a new shell. Actually, this is it right here running. You can see with all the gits and all the, all the, the, the logs. Um, I could just do a Docker PS. Oops. And so this is it running right now, OK? So it's receiving. I'm taking this port. I'm sending it to it. It's leveraging that via its API. And then it's talking with its own Python kernel. So if I were to look at, do I have my Docker file in this one? Yeah, uh, so I'm going to do a cat of that. And you can see all I'm doing is that I've got this container that I'm going to build. It's, it adds all the libraries I need. It, it, it installs Python. It installs the Python you know, uh, libraries I need. And then it just is going to give me this cool interface to play with. It's pretty straightforward. I guess the challenge that I've had is I've, some of the ways that you interact with the APIs directly to mm -hmm. me have seemed cumbersome. You know, whether mm -hmm. I'm writing a Python script or I'm using Postman, and it just, I don't see an easy way to consume them. So maybe I'm just using the wrong tools, and I need to. Well, I think I think that to your point, you're changing your tool set, which makes it hard. All right. Now, if I was a Python developer, I'd be very interested in YDK specifically. If I was writing scripts or templates, I like, for example, I like. Uh, making XML, like a, it's like a Jinja format of the XML payload that I can use as a template. And that way I can have configuration templates for that, that I can deploy whatever my intent is based on that. You know, kind of following the concept of infrastructure as code where I have a template that describes a network function, like creating a VRF, creating an interface, and I have an XML template for that, right? And then I can leverage I mean, this is, this is not intended to be an Ansible commercial, but then I can use Ansible to then le leverage uh, pulling in that template and uh, Jinja replacement with my variables and, and, and exposing that and sending that to the device directly. So what you need is a tool to abstract, right? We're not doing the abstraction as much here. The model abstracts the configuration, but you also would, need pr would probably want a layer beyond that that abstracts that model to data types or... or, or uh, a structure that you'd be comfortable with. So like, for example, not to go too much off topic, but I'm a big fan of going off topic as long as we have time, is if we look at my DevNet session, I've got something where I do an infrastructure as code template, where this is intended to, these are the XML templates that I use to deploy a VRF or an interface via NetConf. But all you need to know is this YAML that you may not be able to read. Let me increase the size of that. That describes the config. So think about it. All I need to know is, or actually, that's, that's the, I want the template, uh, excuse me, the VARS file. All you need to know is, so I've got some tenants. I've got some subnets. I've got some names. That's something you can work with. That's English, right? And then you have some automation behind that. If, you know, in what? 10, 15 minutes, whatever, when, when we have the APKM guys in DNA Center, what, you, what you're using is them as the abstraction layer, right? They're providing you the question. Say, hey, give me, answer me these 12 questions, and I can deploy EasyQuaz across, across your network, right? So it's leverage. There's a couple layers to it, right? We have abstraction via the model to simplify the developer. And then the developer is supposed to extend that abstraction to you via another layer that exposes just what your intent is, all right? So they're going to garner your intent by a, a set of variables and which app you're choosing within DNA Center. Or in this case, I'm just saying, you know, tell me what your tenant is. I've got a development tenant, and I, uh, they're named one, number 103. The, I give them from VLANs. I give them uh, you know, uh, a name and a subnet, and, a, and that's it. That describes that tenant to me. And my automation in the background deploys the VRFs, deploys the interfaces. It's actually a, a poor man's campus fabric all just by this simple description. It's the same concept as DNA Center. It's just an open source version of it. Gotcha. All right, does that make sense? Yeah. So 
So let's uh, so drive back. So to your point, we're saying talking about tools and, 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 and YDK. I mean, I had a meeting with the, some of the QA guys. And I swear, if it was in person, they would have been hugging. They were so excited about leveraging these tools for gathering data from the box. Because they've got to do all kinds of awful screen scraping to gather the data, to validate the configuration that our automation frameworks are, are deploying. It's, not a, it's a thankless task. Because you're looking at it, well, I, just, I could do that in five minutes via CLI. Well, yeah, you could, but they need to do all these extra steps to make sure that nothing went wrong. And that's all show commands, all these other kinds of things to gather the data to validate. Whereas with this, you've got clear, defined data coming back to you in a programmatic, programmatic interface. And we're going to, I apologize again, I, I talk about we're using the CSR instead of that switch back in uh, when RTP where we're going to power challenge today. Uh, Telemetry is brand new to iOS XE. It's something that we've had on XR, something we got on NXOS. But the, the concept behind that is grabbing data off of those devices and shipping it over to the places that need it. So you can see from my dashboard from earlier today, all I did was subscribe to a couple pieces of data, right? So I did a NetConf subscription. It sent me this telemetry data every 10 seconds about my memory usage, my use memory, my, my free memory, my, uh, my packets in and out, uh, CPU, and even the temperature, which I guess wasn't so bad earlier. Um, and even a bunch of, uh, even the raw data back here, just in case I want to look for something. You know, but we, have, we can get, grab any type of data in there. All these leaves that you saw from all these models gives you essentially an infinite amount of information, everything you might want to look at about that box. So that's an incredibly powerful tool. Uh, I want you to understand, like, you know, it's, it's not just about grabbing data, it's grabbing relevant data, right? And making it work for you. So again, what's in it for you? Key value data, key value pairs from your opera data. Telemetry for all these streams. REST access is ubiquitous across all of your servers, be it OSS, BSS, whatever, or even from your iPhone. These YDK bindings that give you direct programmatic access to the box. And actually, I didn't give you a chance to talk about it. You could mount to Open Daylight via NetConf. So you could have that be your central repository for just grabbing operational data. You know, but obviously, everybody should be running DNA Center, but you could also run that as an alternative method for grabbing data or uh, impacting your device. 